Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and we're going to continue our discussion of whole rethinking the science of nutrition and by the way you guys it's time to register for our fall conference and Dr. Campbell is going to be our keynote speaker. He's going to talk about this book and we'll have a chance to hear it from the man himself and then we have Dr. Alan Goldhammer from True North, Dr. Joe Keon, the author of Whitewash, great book on dairy and uh, the jazzy vegetarian Laura Theodore will be with us and she's actually going to sing for us at the Saturday night dinner. I'm really excited about that. All right, so we were talking about genes when we left off on Tuesday, and Campbell, I love this, he says he, just, he frames the discussion of nutrition and genes as hope versus despair. If, you're, if our health is primarily due to genes, and there are still a lot of people who believe that, we're helpless victims and there's really no point in trying to be healthy. But if our habits play a larger role, we can control our health future. Now, there's no question that there are some conditions for which nutrition is not a cure, a broken arm, for example, but there are many more, like diabetes, for which nutrition is the best way to prevent and actually treat the disease. Now, the reason Campbell states that most people believe what scientists tell us about genetics and disease, and the reason why they agree to so many drugs and procedures, is that most people don't understand the origin of disease, and gosh, how could they expect to be, understand it? I mean, they're plumbers and accountants and lawyers and other occupations but they also don't appreciate or understand the body's self-healing capacity. I mean, if you get a cold and you don't do anything, in seven days it goes away. If you scratch your arm and you don't do anything, the body heals itself, and it actually can heal itself from other more serious conditions if given the right tools. So diseases result from the interaction of our genes and the environment, the environment meaning everything, including our diet and lifestyle habits. Now we're born with mostly health promoting genes which we get from our parents and our disease causing genes come partly from our parents and partly from mutations that happen during our lifetime. Our bodies actually can repair mutated genes but a small percentage of them aren't repaired and they multiply. Mutations aren't all bad however and if it weren't for genetic mutations you and I wouldn't be able to have this conversation through video clips right now. In fact it's how we've survived. Research on genetics, however, focuses on the damaged genes, the mutations, with the idea that if we can identify them, we can somehow prevent or treat disease more effectively. But again, it ignores the complexity of both outside factors, such as the environment and nutrition and the complexity of genetic expression. Researchers working on cancer, for example, want to control the expression of cancer-causing genes and eliminate substances that trigger mutations, but we can't get rid of all toxins. I mean, even if chemical toxins were eliminated, um, there are other things like sunlight that we can't eliminate that also cause mutations. In fact, as it turns out, humans have been exposed during our entire time on the planet to cancer-causing substances, but the incidence of cancer has only escalated in modern times. But science still, scientists are still focusing on makeup and household sprays and uh, such things as the cause of cancer, often ignoring the role of much more plausible explanations like nutrition. And this all goes to reinforce the helpless victim mentality because we can't avoid chemical carcinogens and we certainly can't change our genes. And all of this distracts from people doing what they can do, which is to control their diet and lifestyle habits. Campbell also discusses the limitations of research to determine which substances are carcinogenic. Most of the time it starts with animal research in which an animal is dosed with a suspected carcinogen a thousand to ten thousand times higher than the doses that humans encounter. If a significant percentage of the animals develop cancer, the substance is assumed to be a carcinogen. And Campbell cites as an example one study in which lab rats were given aspartame in the amounts uh, equivalent to a human drinking 1,200 cans of soda daily. And it is just silly. He calls it silly. I mean, I've never met anybody who drinks 1,200 cans of anything every day. And he uses, again, I love his analogies, he, he says it's like uh, measuring the effects of being hit by a Mack truck versus being hit by a matchbox car. I mean, there's just no relationship. And then, of course, it doesn't necessarily follow that if the effect is noticed in one species that it will be, be the same in other species, even in those that are closely related, like rats, rats and, and mice. Campbell, Campbell states that the testing of chemicals to find carcinogens is like the work of a, magi of a magician when it comes to how it affects public health. Magicians are experts at directing attention for the main action of the trick, and so you don't notice how the trick is done. Blaming chemicals for cancer distracts from a focus on nutrition and cancer. But research in this area is worth hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and the fact that it hasn't resulted in much really doesn't make much difference to the people who make their living conducting this type of research. 
Well, the research community, Campbell says, is trapped in the paradigm that chemicals cause cancer. And, and one of the things that keeps people trapped there is the idea that um, if we talk about nutrition and lifestyle as being the cause of cancer, it somewhat focuses blame on the victim, uh, which some people believe it's unfair. It's much more politically correct to focus on something outside the person who has cancer, like chemicals and you know air pollution. And there are jobs, careers, and institutions all built on this belief. In fact, I didn't know this, but three quarters of the 75,000 pathologists in the United States are involved in testing chemicals and carcinogens, and they're really not much interested in knowing that their research is misguided and useless. And those are his terms. When these people do acknowledge that nutrition might play a role, they focus on individual nutrients since this fits within their reductionist model. And again, going back to something I said earlier that Campbell talks about in the book, these are the types of studies that get funding. So um, anyway, I am really enjoying going through the book again and pointing this stuff out. I hope that, um, that you're able to translate the things that I'm telling you uh, into usable sound bites to use with your patients and clients. And of course, I'll post the whole article on the Health Brace Online Library as soon as we're finished with the series. So uh, that's all for today and this week. Have a wonderful day and weekend, and I will be back to you again next Tuesday.